Hi, everyone. Today we have uh, Maria Teresa Kumar, who is president of Voto Latino, uh, which I looked up and it means Vote Latino. And uh, it's an organization that uh, has been in existence for for quite a while, and uh, it really is about engaging Latinos in politics here in the United States. And uh, you should know that I do some research uh, when I have a guest, but I'm not I'm not like Terry Gross, who really, really, I mean, she wins awards. You know, and she really does research. But uh, we're going to just start here in the middle of the conversation. I think we I was just talking to her and she might have been off mic a little bit at the beginning here. I think you'll be impressed. I think you'll be impressed. Yep. Your dad was a Peterson. Yep. You were a Peterson. Yep. E.N. E.N. Okay. Danish. Danish stock. Danish. Yeah. Okay. I but thought I am Norwegian. adopted on my father. I'm adopted on my father's side. So, oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yep, I see. yep, yep, yep. So you don't have that Danish I stock in you. I don't have you. the Danish stock in me, but I have his travel bug. I read something. He went to Alaska and then, to, and then drove down to Bogota. You did your homework. I think you're the only person that has ever interviewed me that actually knows this, by the way. I'm impressed. So my father, I, I have this thing called Google. Google? <laughs> <laughs> you're the only one interested and curious enough. <laughs> I would, I'll tell you, my father was the neatest man I ever met. Now, you moved when you were four mm -hmm. from Columbia to the United States to Sonoma County. Mm -hmm. uh, I moved when I was four from New Jersey to Minnesota. So we have very, very, very similar. similar. <laughs> they spoke differently in Minnesota than mm -hmm. they did in New Jersey, the same language. So I know it's more difficult to move from Bogota from an, one country to another, Columbia. The only re reason I want to ask you about this mm -hmm. is that I, I'm a grandfather now, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that a four-year-old sees things differently than like a two-year-old or than like a six-year-old. Mm -hmm. And so I just am curious. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any memories from that move? Absolutely. So, any, okay. yeah. No, I do. From so the I eyes remember, of a four-year-old. Four so I remember Bogota is a big city. At the time, it was roughly four million people. And I remember getting into a cab with my dad and my mom. Uh, it was right before Christmas, so we it was it was around we we spent our first Christmas here in seventy seven. So it was right around Christmas. So it was December twenty second or so. Okay. And we basically did one last round of Bogota because it's known for its Christmas lights. And I remember barely seeing above the window, looking at the lights. Mm -hmm. And I remember that my mom was talking about how we were going to make a move, and my dad was getting me ready that we were going to move. The next day, I remember getting on a flight. My first memory of America was in the back of a car that was green and smelled earthy mm -hmm. and looking through the window. And I remember clearly seeing the Golden Gate Bridge. And then my first memory is waking up to the same smell of dust. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was in my grandmother's kitchen. And I had, for the very first time, Campbell's minestrone soup. I just did not know what it was, and it was mm. delicious. The reason I realized that everything was earthy was looking out the door, looking out the window. Do you remember and my a smell? I smell a smell, and I remember the, this is a farmer's house, so they literally had the kitchen table, but then they had a bed right next to it, and then they had the stoves that you put wood in. But I remember like waking up, and the smell was earthy, and looking out, and there was no lights. I had just come from Bogota, Colombia, where there was... Oh, it's where was the lights. city? You know, and, so, and so look, peering through, and the earthy smell was that I had just been welcomed into my grandparents' So you have sensory, sensory, sensory memories. Yep. That's, uh, and my mother and my grandmother crying a lot as they departed because every Colombian cries when they leave uh, someone at the airport. So. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, let's... Uh, I, I want to talk about so many things. We'll cover so many things. Uh, you are president of Voto Latino. Mm -hmm. You've been at for how long? We are going to uh, celebrate our 15-year anniversary this year. We're calling it Los Quince. Okay, and and the, the purpose of the organization is to get Latinos engaged in politics. Right, so 15 years ago, we basically saw where we were in this moment in our country. When we started, we had roughly 30,000 Latinos turning 18 every month. Now we have over 100,000. I grew up in California under Pete Wilson, and Pete Wilson galvanized the Latino community because yep. he decided that we were the bad guys. 
So 14 years ago, when we started seeing the numbers on the wall, we like, you know, there's uh, an opportunity to make sure that there is a political voice in the Latino community, but not surprised that there were bad actors at the same time trying to subvert that voice. And so we started registering the youngest population of Americans that we've seen in a long time. Uh, 60% of Latinos are under the age of 33. The median age of whites is 54. So in other words, they'll be working for a long time, for a long and, time. and supporting me. Right, exactly right. right. That's exactly right. Because so, and- if it weren't for immigrants to this yeah. country, uh, and a lot of these uh, Latinos in California aren't mm-hmm. immigrants, they yeah. might have been in a couple California. Couple generations ago. Well, <laughs> they may be, have actually been in California when California was Mexico, right? That's right. So they were, the, in some cases, oddly, mm-hmm. the immigrants, if yeah. I don't know. It gets I don't know, I don't know how that works out. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but... Uh, so, Eva Longori- so Eva Longoria always says, I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. That's how oh, she Oh, that's good. It. See, yeah, she, yeah. she expressed it much better. Than yeah, that. She's had longer to think about but it. She has. She I has. had no time. <laughs> no time. But you, you were almost there. You got it. Okay, so uh, l- let's talk about uh, some of the, uh, what Voto Latino does. Now, you obviously register voters mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and get them out to vote. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask you just about, you remember that President Trump claims that he won the popular vote, that the three million votes that uh, Hillary Clinton won by were all, every one of the, those votes were undocumented immigrants who voted illegally, and that we were going to find them, the, the commission, Kobach commission. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, it, you know, that reminded me of like when O.J. Uh, was acquitted and he said, I'm going to s- spend the rest of my life looking for the killer. Yeah. You know what I appreciate about the president is that he decided that he was going to find the three million undocumented immigrants. But when it comes to reunifying the thousands of children that are in his custody, he doesn't know how to do that. He also didn't know how to find the three million. Right, no. Well, because there wasn't three million. No, but but I'm just being facetious. But so first of all, just to set the table, the idea that someone who is living in the shadows, afraid of their government, is going to go and not only register, but then cast a ballot and become a felon for doing so is just ludicrous. And so with the Chris Kobach Commission, it was shown that none of the states, Republican or Democrat Secretary of States, wanted to participate because they realized that it was a farce, that it was a complete sham. What the president does very well is identify a group of people and demonize them, even though he himself has made his riches off employing these very people. And so what we're seeing is a huge transformation demographically in our country. And because we don't have the right representation, the right storytelling of the nuances that are happening in different sectors of the country, uh, people are afraid because their neighborhoods are changing quickly. Their communities are changing quickly. And then a demagogue like the president comes in and basically is able to feed those flames because there's no alternative of what is actually happening and the opportunity that it presents itself with this energized group of Americans that deeply value their country, but that they are young and then they are new. And how do we basically uh, integrate them as fast as possible into the system is a benefit for all of us. Al, we know that in 2020, we're going to have 12 million more young voters than baby boomers. And so our job right now is to put our heads down and register as many of those voters as possible. We can't wait until the last minute like we like to do. We know that the majority of of Super Tuesday is going to be, at least for the work that we do, by Super Tuesday, we're going to know whether there's weight in the Latino vote. We're going to have Texas, California, Nevada, and Arizona all before March 3rd of next year. And so we just need to make sure that we... We are very clear on what we want, and that is we want maximum participation in our democracy. This past November, that's what it showed, is that maximum participation, people saw in America that reflected in them. And that is makes for good debate and ideally for good policy. Yeah, we were talking about just the, the demographics mm-hmm. of work, of, yeah. of, of work in this country. And I'm 67, not collecting Social Security yet, but I will be, uh, well, I guess, when I'm 70 or 71 or something. And there'll be a lot of us. This is a big generation. And as you said, the, demographically, uh, the average age of Latinos in America is 33, did no, you No, the average age is 27. Really? The okay. 60% of Latinos are under the age of 33. I see, I see, I see. Okay. Uh, the median age of a white person in America is 54. The median age of a Latino mm. is 19 years old, Al. 19 years old. Latinos are younger than we are, and that's good 
good for us because uh, you'll be supporting me, or they will be, or absolutely young workers will. Uh, be. They'll be well, and without this influx of and ninety percent of Latinos under the age of eighteen are U.S. born. They are American born. They are entitled to the rights of Ameri- of every single American, and they over index when it comes to enrolling in the in the military. Yes, they are very proud patriots, but. Absent this influx of Latinos that happened in the late 80s, early 90s, our birth rates would be more akin to that of Japan, more akin to that of Europe, where they are all experiencing declining birth rates and declining economies. And it is an opportunity for us to recognize that our country's DNA has been built on that of immigrant sweat and dreams. And for us to have this... We're in a country of immigrants. Yeah. No, and to have this... We're having a schizophrenic debate of our identity. Uh, I always say that that person that whether they're at MIT lab trying to figure out a genetic code or someone swimming around the Rio Grande, what unites them is that they have a dream that they could be best here in the country. And we're getting the folks that are hungry and that are entrepreneurs. And we should continue fostering that energy because that is what keeps us ahead of the game on the, on the world scale, I believe. Yeah, but we don't, don't want them uh, from shithole countries. Oh, we definitely want them from shithole countries. No, no, because no. Because you know we what? Some... Because we because from those countries, they're the. I have to say, my mom was a single mom. I am completely cognizant that had we stayed in Colombia, my destiny would have been completely carved out because of our socioeconomic status. There is no doubt. Coming to America opened up the possibility, and every single day I'm grateful. My family is grateful, even though we have seen some systemic injustices in the system, not for me, but for my cousins. But we know that we have the opportunity here that would not have been afforded in the country that we were born in. I I just want to see how people from countries that used to be considered Mm -hmm. shithole countries, like Ireland and Italy, how they've done. Mm -hmm. That's why we're having Sean Hannity as our next guest. (laughs) Really? No. <laughs> I'm like, I want to buy the popcorn for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about voter suppression. Yes. Basically, there's, there's incredibly little voter fraud. It basically doesn't happen. All the, yeah. the studies show that. Tell me about suppression. The famous case in front of the Supreme Court, Shelby County against Eric Holder, and Eric Holder doesn't like that I add his name to it, but it was the- Because he lost. Because he lost. <laughs> well- <laughs> He lost 5-4. 5-4. Five, four, <laughs> four. Uh, because uh, everything's 5-4 with the Roberts Court, and it's important. And this basically overturned the Voting Rights Act. I it mean, completely got yeah, it. It yeah, gutted it and basically it. said that the, it had to go back to Congress so that Congress could modernize it. Good luck with that. We know our Congress doesn't want to participate. Well, and they're not well, activist judges because it overturned the Voting Rights Act that they passed unanimously in the Senate. So I used to hear these things from Republicans saying, uh, we don't want judges to make law from the bench. And they were, you know, that's that's for the legislative branch to do. And the legislative branch unanimously in the Senate, and almost mm-hmm. unanimously in the House, had voted for uh, this extension of the Voting yeah. Rights Act. Right. Well, they don't like it until they start sacking it with really young judges that are extreme views that we're seeing right now with the, with the president. But so right. Shelby County, that that specifically that county had seen an over 40 percent increase in the Latino population from the last census. If you follow to the T every single jurisdiction that followed, it was roughly 22 jurisdictions. They had all seen at least a 25 percent increase in the Latino population. And so when we talk about voter suppression, it was not that they were staving off there. They were preparing for this moment when young Latinos were going to come of age into our electoral process. And they were trying to do everything to prevent it at a structural level. Now, what Shelby County did was it struck the preclearance provision in the the, uh, Voting Rights Act, which is that the federal government, the Justice Department, had to approve any significant change in the voting system in certain states and mm-hmm. certain counties uh, around around the country, mainly in the South. Mm-hmm. And as soon as Shelby County went away, Chief Justice Roberts wrote the decision and said that, uh, you know, the, the, it's worked. It's worked and we don't have, you know, we don't need it anymore. We don't need preclearance. Justice Ginsburg said, this is like saying I'm not wet so I can throw away my umbrella. Yep. And she was right. She was absolutely right. Because, because how wet did we get right away? To give you an idea that 2014, so this happened in 2013, 2014, it was the lowest participation in 100 years. 
And in 2016, over 200 voting booths went missing in North Carolina alone. North Carolina is really an awful violator of uh, voting rights. In fact, the Fourth Circuit ruled that Mm -hmm. in 14, Texas and North Carolina were... They were right on were it. As quick. soon as Shelby County happened, they started, they started raining, mm-hmm. and uh, people got wet. And and the uh, Fourth Circuit said that their new voting laws had tried to disenfranchise African Americans with almost surgical precision. That's right. So overturn that, but and that fourteen election was very close uh, for the Senate, very uh, close for, for Tillis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, that was the perfect example of. Why Roberts, it was just crazy wrong. Well, and that in 2014 was an example of how they were getting started. Uh, 2016, they had over 900 booths that went missing, disproportionately in African-American and Latino neighborhoods. To give you an idea, in Florida, where we did a lot of work, they physically took the voter registration booth, the polling place, outside of university campuses, where young people were living on university campuses. Most of them didn't have a car, so they had to drive 18 miles to go to a voting booth. And so what we did is we partnered with Lyft, and we actually started giving kids rides to the voting booth. It was done by design, by purpose, not surprisingly. Of course, they don't want students voting because, uh, like in Texas, Mm -hmm. right, they have voter ID, but you can't use your college ID. You can can use your gun license ID, but I can't show my ID that I'm getting educated by the Texas university system to prove that I should be a voter. It was gross negligence. A lot of times, a lot of folks, you know. Now, to some people, that seems odd. Well, it is odd. It is disenfranchisement at the most blatant level. And when folks... But, you know, a gun can be deadly, so that's a big responsibility. Your mind can be deadly. I'm just being devil's advocate here. But your your mind can be deadly if you're actually well-informed. Well, the Unabomber was very... (laughs) Well, thanks for going there. (laughs) Come on, Al, give me something. (laughs) Okay, well, I was was just playing devil's advocate there. Okay, the wall, the damn wall. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with a a 2,000-mile wall? Besides it being completely impossible to build because of the topography of where that wall would lie, it's a farce. And I think that the majority of Americans... Is it? Complete farce. <laughs> Come on, channel your Sean Hannity, please. Okay, so uh, Trump <laughs> likes to say that uh, the speaker is for uh, open borders. No one's... A, 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 a no for, one is. No I have not is. seen, heard of one Democratic office holder say they're for open borders. And what are open borders anyway? That that just means no enforcement Fluidity, whatsoever right, yeah. on the border. But that's, I mean, that, that's but, comical. But that's, that's a lie. Yeah, it's an that's absolute a lie. lie. Yeah. Uh, and Can you imagine, remember uh, uh, Obama uh, said that uh, if you like your insurance, you can keep it, and that was called the lie of the year. And uh, can you imagine a lie of the year now? Which one would you pick? Which of the six thousand? Yeah, uh, that would be uh, it. Would be the lie of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy Pelosi is uh, wants open borders. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, just the concept of a lie of the year now is crazy. Well, the challenge is that the president has always been for our country the moral compass, the leader that we aspire to or at least has the moral authority, uh, the person who occupies it. That's where we've wanted. That's the aspiration. And yeah, but it's not that, always been the case. No, it has not been the case. But it's not always been the case. No, but there has been severe penalties when those understandings are broken. And in this case, uh, he's basically thrown all of that out the window. But this he's, is like a crazy, crazy he's, he has thing. A, yeah, yeah, no, he's authoritarian who happens to be running a democratic country. Uh, and I think he is maybe pathological, that he is a, uh, oh boy, a malignant narcissist. That's that's what we call him, right? Yeah, he's definitely not benign in any uh, any other stuff that he yeah. does. I mean, let's take the, the case of child separation. That was done by design to impose the most harmful cruelty to a child. Let's talk about ICE then and, and child separation and mm-hmm. Stephen Miller mm-hmm. uh, speaking of malignant. What the hell? I have written a a few movies, Mm -hmm. and uh, I would think that if you wanted to establish right away in the first scene a country that's a dystopia, you would have a scene where an immigration judge Mm -hmm. speaks to a four-year-old or five-year-old child 
who has to make the case. The, the child, right. without a lawyer, right. has to make the case for asylum. And they don't even speak the language. No, but they get an interpreter. Right. To be fair, the four-year-old or the five-year-old gets an interpreter. How fucking bad is that? How, uh, if you opened a movie with that, you'd go like, this is the worst country. What country is this? Yeah. No. They obviously got an American actor to play the judge. Yeah. So, but I don't know if it's, it, it can't be America. Right. It can't be the United States of America. Well, what it, country are they portraying? Right. And that, I think, for so many of us, is the reason it hurts is that we, we established the rules of engagement when it came to asylum seekers and refugees. We went to the UN and said these are the minimum standards that we expect to ensure that ethnic minorities around the world are protected. And we are breaking our laws every single day. And I don't just say that superfluously. The U- UN has actually declared that what we're doing is we're violating. violating are there the organizations of that help pay for lawyers, immigration lawyers that a, can go down to the border? I mean, we—that's part of the. Yeah. We have a shortage, right? We have a so- shortage of that, but then also they are. So I would say there's two organizations that okay. are fantastic. One is Raices. They're based in this. They're in McAllen, and they basically receive uh, fees to pay for lawyer. For, okay, for what, lawyers. what's the name of the Raices? Raices. How uh-huh. do you spell it? R A I C E S, uh, and it's run by a really wonderful Irish chap. Uh, so it's doing really God's work. But then there's also an organization in El Paso uh, that is. I would consider the modern-day Underground Railroad. It's called the Annunciation House, and it is a network of 20 organizations, mostly faith-based, 20 organizations, two hotels. And every single day, Ruben Garcia, the head of Annunciation, receives a text message from ICE, from Border Security, saying, we are about to release 200 people. They need lodging for the night. Five families, three females. and And so this man via a text messaging network, has to find shelter for these individuals, has to connect them with individuals around the country so that they can get on a bus, they can have a meal, they can have a safe place to be, and then basically they can have connections to other people that may be their sponsors around the country. And I imagine he's making a lot of money doing this. Not at all. I I mean, I imagine he's... He is in it under, for the money. Right. No. Okay, I'm jumping in here just to tell you that to contribute to Riasis or Annunciation House or both, you can go to alfranken.com and help these really unbelievable people out. For folks to, to better understand, the private detention industry is a multi billion dollar industry. The fact that this man and his network of nuns has to cobbled together airfare or a greyhound or a meal is obscene. The fact that what you're going to hear now is the president saying deportations are down in our country. He's not wrong. Deportations are absolutely down because the length of detention is much longer. During this government shutdown, when there wasn't any money for anything, he quietly propped up over 40,000 beds in the Midwest to detain people for a long, long time. And it's because someone is making a lot of money out of out of workers, because the majority of these folks that come are working. So they're private for profit? For profit. Detentions. Detentions. Mm-hmm. I spoke to one of the volunteers, and he was describing to me a little boy from Guatemala. He was eight years old, uh, that he was being housed in one of these, uh, these shelters. And I said, well, what was striking about him? He said, well, he wanted to know if there were coffee plantations, because he picks really well. Al, he was eight years old. He came here to work. It's shocking and immoral when we talk about this page in our history. These are crimes against humanity. The fact that the administration openly admits that we have thousands of children that are separated from their families and they've given up on finding their parents, it's more than a shame on us. It is something that the American people need to rise up and not only demand that the individuals that are heading up these agencies are actually prosecuted, but that these families, every single one of them, is reunited with their children. It's uh, it's, uh, Shonda. I mean, it's... it's... Let me ask you about the census. Mm -hmm. Since 1950, we haven't had a question on the census about the 
citizen status of the folks in the house. Where is this now? Is this in court? It's in court, and from my understanding that there is an opportunity still that they can remove the citizenship question. This was basically done now, this is by- intended to intimidate people? To set the table, there's roughly 16 million Americans that live in mixed-status households, meaning that there is someone in their family that may be undocumented. The idea of putting a census question on the on the census is to, because it's a government form, it's to intimidate people to not fully fill out the census or not to do it at all. By not filling out the census, you deprive people not just of representation, but also of the trillion dollars that our government spends for roads, education. On the business side, it allows businesses not to know where they should put the next storefront and create jobs. I mean, it creates a mess, not just for identifying you know, who gets resources, but potentially for jobs and for our economy. And so the president under Wilbur Ross has basically said, we're going to put that, we're going to smack down that census so that basically it prevents people from fair representation. That is their number one issue. But that those tactics of intimidation don't just hurt the Latino community. It hurts the country because by the Constitution, you, we have to know who is living within our borders. That is, that is one of the few government functions that is actually demanded by the Constitution. The Trump administration and data, you know, it, it was surprising in the Senate how many arguments in legislation were about data. Hmm. Because data is so important in being able to understand how to apply resources, but Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, like in education. Mm -hmm. I remember at one point we were trying to get in the ESSA, the new replacement for No Child Left Behind, to separate out the data on Asians, Mm -hmm. uh, on how they were doing. Basically, we're saying we're going to accumulate data from people from a hemisphere, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. and without separating, uh, you know, Hmong kids mm-hmm. from, you know, who are first generation or second generation mm-hmm. from, um, you know, Chinese who have been here for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. So you have those kind of fights oh, and data is so important. And this administration has suppressed data. Yep. Well, and they've literally removed data from removed. their websites. Yes. I mean, they basically no longer make. So they've removed data on Puerto Rico on how long the electricity has been down and the water has been mm-hmm. down. The currency for this administration is the opposite of transparency. And it, he, they do it by design because they realize that the less access and transparency that the public has on what the president is doing, and his administration is doing, they could sell off our natural resources like they're doing when it comes to doing deals while the government shutdown is gone. They can trade in who is and isn't American. Uh, They took down statistics on how many people were naturalized and not. I mean, the the stuff that they've done is not only by design, but the American people, when people say, well, why should I care? It's like, because our tax dollars actually pay into these systems. We are the ones that actually have to have a transparent government because that is what our currency is. That's what makes us function, and that's what makes us hold our elected people accountable because at the end of the day, they work for us. Wilbur Ross is head of the mm-hmm. Commerce mm-hmm. Department, which is really the Department of Data. Yep. They do the census, mm-hmm. obviously. They have NOAA. NOAA is about uh, 65% of their budget of the Commerce Department. Within NOAA is the Weather Service. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Weather Service's data is completely transparent. They appointed a guy to head NOAA who is the CEO of AccuWeather who wanted to suppress all the data from the Weather Channel and just so that people had to go to AccuWeather. No, I mean, so I keep joking that and they're corrupt. They're absolutely corrupt. Yeah, no, I keep I keep joking that you know we have right now what we have in our White House is basically an Austin Powers gone awry. You know, we have fembots, we have Russians, we have, and everybody's trying to sell to the highest bidder. And while we look to a change in the administration in 2020, what we also need to do is that we are ensuring that these institutions of government stay and that we weed out any cancer of corruption as fast as possible. Because the reason that America is as strong as it is is that we have not had that epidemic that has hit so many other countries. And that is this idea of of corruption, basically. Yeah, well, this is, uh, you know, if we reelect this guy, I'm afraid (laughs) of democracy in this country. Mm -hmm. He seems to admire every autocrat around the world. Uh, You know, uh, corruption is... 
part of the path toward that. Mm -hmm. And his family is profiting. We certainly know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm going to not vote for Trump. Thank you. (laughs) You said it here first. You wanted to talk a little bit about Schultz and Bloomberg, I think. For me... I think that we need to have a debate of ideas within the Democratic Party. I think that is rich and wonderful. And the the nominees eventually are the ones that hold the imaginations of the American people the best. My challenge with one declaring independent and the other one saying what we can't do, I just find it really rich that these are two billionaires who had a kernel of, a, of an idea, who transformed their industries, and now well, trying to... Well, he had to, a bean of an idea. <laughs> he had a bean and, of an idea. Uh, and a terminal of an idea. And a terminal <laughs> of an idea, which I think is more sophisticated than a bean. But, no, the, the uh, Schultz's uh, rollout was so awful. Uh, Bloomberg, I think, is... Uh, a serious guy. He's been, uh, you know, a mayor of the largest city. Uh, well, mm-hmm. yeah, largest city. Yeah. And, and also been a champion on climate and on guns. And he's running the Democratic Party, which is what he, we right. should be doing. But we I can't think, split this. No, one. we can't split it. But I think the challenge really is, is if we do not understand what income inequality is after we saw bread lines of federal workers. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's disgusting. I, it's, I think it's, that it's, the it's, shutdown brought to light how close to the edge so many Americans are. Because federal workers have a steady job. People think of them have a good, steady job. And it turns out they're within two weeks Right. Or four weeks of a breadline, or missing a house yeah. payment, or and that is payment. and that is why when I I hear folks saying, "Well, we can't do this," it's it's a lack of will because a hundred years ago we were at the crossroads of many things. We had an immigration uh, debate. We were basically changing from a technological workforce from agriculture to industrial. We had the Great Depression. We had Great War, and what we decided was that we were going to double down on America, and we created a strong, thriving middle class. And right now, we are at a cross points in this country where we have to think ambitiously and audaciously because otherwise... I think we need to make America great again. I I would tweak it on the sides. Yeah, I've never never seen such a a nasty face (laughs) when I said that. I didn't mean that. It's ironic. I I liked Al. (laughs) (laughs) What are your priorities? Uh, Let's say... Uh, mm-hmm. we, we win. Let's say we win. Uh, what are your priorities going forward? you got two minutes. <laughs> I, I want to register a hell of a lot of voters first. That is, uh, it doesn't matter who our nominees are on the Republican or Democratic side. What we're going to need is... Well, that's your priority to, in uh, order to win. To win. And we have to start early, and we can't take any voter for granted. Uh, our job is to expand the electoral map. And the more we expand the electoral map, then we have a debate of ideas, and we have a so your priority right now is to win. Yes. I see. Uh, <laughs> so Keep your you, head down and win. <laughs> so your priority is uh, where your priority should be, which mm. is in the present. Mm. I Very th- good. Yeah, thank you. Let that be a lesson <laughs> to all, all of you. Be in the present. Be here now. A lot, there's a lot of work to be done, and I think what happened was in the 2016, everybody was basically sham, you know, opening up the champagne bottles way too soon. Thank you, and thank you uh, for, for uh, hope we can do it again. Yeah, Maybe. no, absolutely. No, okay. it, it was great to see you. Nice great. to have you back. I want to thank uh, Leo Kotke for the beautiful music. He laid it down in a studio in Minneapolis when we, uh, actually I did my first of these, and he just came in and there was a mic, and he played into it. And that was it. We didn't. And I think it's gorgeous. 